You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome Welcome to to the the Advisor's Advisor's Option, Option. the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the The Advisor's advisor's option. Option. All right, everybody. That music means we are back. Time for our monthly sojourn on the dark side of options with a little show we call around these parts, The Advisor's Option. My name, of course, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you are binging these days, the network that continues to grow since the last time we gathered here together on The Advisor's Option program we have indeed launched a new show a new addition to the network the futures rundowns all of you out there who are curious let's say futures curious <laughs> of which there are a growing number of you you have been besieging me at events and on email and social media when are you going to do futures when are you going to do futures well we could resist no longer listeners so the futures rundown now four episodes strong gonna have episode five coming up tomorrow so if you listen into the full network you're already getting that in your feed. If you're not, if you just listen into the advisor's option, A, we love you. Welcome. B, you're missing out on a whole bunch of other great content there. So check it out wherever you're getting this show. Make sure you're getting the full Options Insider Radio Network feed. It will serve you well. And let's see who's joining us on the old advisor's option program today. I am pleased to welcome back my compatriot in all things advisor's option, Mr. Matt Ambertson, the principal over there at Options Research and Technology Services, a.k.a. ORATS. Mr. Matt, welcome back to the show, sir. Mark, great to be here. We get asked about futures a lot, too. We've uh, we've fought it off a little better than you have. Uh, we said but no. I think we're weakening. <laughs> we said no. We said no. They kept raising the offers. I said, oh, okay, fine. You lured me to the dark side. 
So to the world of future as we go and to the PL statement, we go. What the heck happened in the options markets since our last episode? Let's find out with the PL statement. All right, everybody, welcome to the PL statement, the segment that was born out of the pandemic because we spent so much time at the top of the show doing exactly what we're doing right now, which is kind of just breaking down what the hell happened in the world of options and vol and everything else since our last show, because it seems like every week something unprecedented has been popping off. Of course, since the last time we gathered here together on the advisor's option, we've seen the Fed, we've seen the tail end of earnings season, we've seen all kinds of interesting things going on out there. Uh, so a lot to unpack. Well, let's kick things off. Mr. Matt, you know, you have been quite busy since the last time I chatted with you. In fact, uh, you and the team put together quite the magnum opus, sir, on what you're expecting heading into the election as well as the upcoming unemployment report. So a lot to unpack. We'll get to all that fun data in a second. But first, sir, let's look back a little bit. What caught your eye out there in the ups and downs, the travails in the market and volatility over the past month, sir? It seems like about once a month, the market gets a good correction. Back in August, you know, kind of the tail end of earnings, we got a good correction. And then things just kind of kind of settle back in and then come back, fall off quickly and then kind of climb back up. It looks like the beginning of a fall off right now. If I had to guess, you got Ivy popping off a little bit. You got Contango coming down. Uh, that's positively correlated with the market. And then we track this uh, flat forward volatility relationship and that's coming down. Uh, looks like we're going to be in for a little bit uh, this week, Marks, and it's uh, you know been a pretty quiet month up until now. So uh, we'll see what comes. So you're saying this little bit of a of a downturn we're seeing today, which as we're recording this, listeners, the first of October. So welcome to Rocktober, listeners. Uh, we are seeing the markets in a bit of a, a tizzy out there. S and P off nearly a full percent, about nine tenths of a percent right now. Was down more earlier. Uh, the Nasdaq off about one and a half percent, again also off its lows, and the Dow off about a quarter of a percent. Uh, VIX Cash did uh, soar north of the twenty handle inch recession, got up to about twenty and three quarters. Now uh, several handles below that, at about an eighteen and a half right now, as we're kicking off the show here proper. So still frothy, still elevated compared to where it was just a session or two ago, but also coming off. The lows out there, but it sounds like Mr. Matt, uh, you're saying maybe this little bit of a of a rip to the downside. You think it has some legs, sir? Yeah, and uh, as you alluded to, this Friday we're going to get a huge number. I mean, the market always tends to focus on something. You know, when you're in the market long enough, they they focus on almost everything. But now it's the unemployment, non-farm payrolls on Friday, and um, we're estimating that. Uh, the ETFs, just the relationship between the expiration implied volatilities, looks like about a over a percent move. Now we're down a percent today. That has more probably to do with some geo macro events. But uh, on Friday, they're really expecting um, a pretty big, pretty big move. I mean, I was looking at the the term structure, and then October fourth just popped out Friday. Uh, as much higher than any other uh, any other month. I was wondering why our scanners were kind of picking that out. Uh, our scanners don't know that there is this unemployment report on that day, but you could see that those uh, overvalued options, uh, who knows if they'll be overvalued, but they are uh, cer certainly going off uh, right now. Uh, so we'll see what happens. You know, interesting stuff out there, of course, since our last episode, listeners, we had the Fed surprising a lot of people, not everyone, obviously, uh, with the half point cut as opposed to the quarter point cut. So clearly a lot of folks in the market out there putting a lot of emphasis on this upcoming number this Friday on whether that will maybe give us more fuel for the fire. Matt, were you in the camp? Some people looked at that half point cut and said, OK, Maybe things are a little bit more dire than perhaps we anticipated. Were, were you in that camp? Where did you fall on the half-point cut, sir? Yeah, I mean, it, they were 
foreshadowing it pretty well. Um, it, it, it's it's an interesting thing. I mean, uh, you know, I really think that there's that it's that's it's somewhat political too. They they want to make the the money pretty free and easy before the election here. That the Fed is pretty politicized. So I think it had as much to do with that as as much as what they've been seeing in the economy. So it would be hard to say. You know, there's so many layers of it. Uh, but it was. It seemed like it was pretty expected. Uh, we were. We were. Uh, I put a post out about the implied interest rates, and they had really fallen off. Uh, so, the option prices out in the market will imply. Uh, you know, using put call parity, what, if you hold everything else constant. You have an interest rate, and so if you solve for that interest rate, it was coming out much lower, and pretty much right on uh, where it has fallen. So, uh, you know, we, it was a, a real big shock. People were expecting it, and, and you know, I think again, it's not necessarily. I think you were alluding to, you know, poor things happening in, in the economy. I think it's as much that as uh, you know the political. We have a, a month until the election, and I think it's. Very well time for that, Mark. Oh, is there an election this year? I wasn't aware, Matt. I, I've been I've been busy. Is it an election cycle? <laughs> yeah. Is there something going on, on the electoral front? Well, let's get to that then, listeners, as well. We also talked about, obviously, the near-term driver that is unemployment. But one of the other drivers, one of the other catalysts for volatility that we've been looking at all year long has pretty much been the impending presidential election. Now, we've been saying for a while on shows like Volatility Views, and to a lesser degree here, that there was a bit of a kink out there, as to be expected. It's in the October futures, because VIX, of course, a a 30-day forward-looking instrument, listeners. Uh, So those October futures were reflecting a lot of juice. Uh, The question was, was it warranted? Is it not enough? That's been the debate. That happens every time we have a presidential election, listeners. There's always a debate about, is it enough? Is it too much? The bump we see out there in the October cycle. Well, now we have, of course, listed options that are expiring right around the election date as well. Election date this year, listeners, November 5th. So we have uh, S&P. Now, of course, we all know we can trade S&P pretty much every day of the week, but we now have expiries opening up and starting to build OI all the way out there to November 8th in spy and it sounds like matt you and the team over there noticed some interesting trends with that early oi sir what'd you spot yeah so uh yeah thanks for mentioning that mark so we came out with a blog today uh put it up on on your blog as well so you could go check it out either spot but you know the november 8th expiration has just been uh it's probably three business days old so uh, we took a task to go and look and see, because that's a better date than, I think, than November 15th. It was the, the closest one to the fifth uh, uh, election day. So now that we got the eighth, that's really going to be helpful. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll start getting some some dailies around uh, elections. So that's really going to be cool. You'll be able to look at, you know, how much are they going to know on the Tuesday? How much are they going to know on the Wednesday? Uh, and that relationship will be interesting. Uh, but, yeah, what we've done so far with uh, right now, we we were just given the Friday expiration after the Tuesday election. And there's not we, we showed in one of our graphics that there's not a lot of OI, but there is trading going on and uh, the market makers have bumped it up enough. I think it was six points higher than the the immediate one uh, before that, uh, the Friday before. So we we did our calculations and and that equates to a little over a 1% move in the SPY. So uh, uh, that's pretty significant. And um, then if you start looking at the Qs and even the Russell, I mean, the Russell is out like 3%. Uh, so, you know, the Russell, small stocks, more volatile, but also uh, if something happens out there, uh, it means a lot more to small stocks than the bigger stocks is what the market's saying. And a 3% move is 
quite significant, even for the Russell mark. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, this is the first presidential election with the new within the new zero DTE era, you know, in our last big election special, which we're thinking about doing again this year. It was so fun when we did it back in uh, 2016, 2020. Obviously, I think other things were prevailing out there, but we can probably bring it back now for 2024. And this is the first time you could really dial in that specific degree of hedging or speculation that you want just around the event itself in the past. You had to use monthlies or maybe weeklies. Now, if you just are worried about what's going to happen, is the market going to fall out of bed the day after the election? You can go out and just buy that put. It's pretty easy. So I wonder if we'll see. I know you've been saying for a while, Matt, that you think the zero-day phenomenon has muted volatility overall. I wonder if we'll see a muted election night ball as a result because people can just put on a hedge for the next day and just buy the next day put and they're good to go. What do you think? Uh, I still have PTSD from I had uh, Trump winning back in in 2016 into 17 and I had just puts and galore and I just go oh in the market uh, the only thing that was trading was like the Dow was down yeah. 800 points yeah you were right right out of the gate it was down nearly a thousand handles you're right but that was in the and I was like oh this is gonna be great yeah. and then. Um, you know, if I would have, I could have. I didn't have the opportunity to, or set up to trade at night. But so I came in the next morning, and I'm like, "Is my computer on? Because the market hasn't even moved. I mean, what's going on here?" Like, and then I figured out that it was not my computer, but the market actually hadn't moved. And I'm like, "What is going on?" So I still, I still am. Uh, have PTSD from that. I can. I just could not believe it. You know, with Trump getting elected, what would happen in the market? Anyway, yeah. I mean, uh, this is going to be. Didn't wasn't I? Didn't we do an election thing? Am I thinking some like the last cycle? Weren't we talking? Or what was that for? I, I well, we talked remember. a lot about the futures. Uh, that was, as you recall, on shows like Volviews and on this show. That was a big talking yeah. point at the beginning of 2020. You came out of the gate, beginning of 2020, saying this. This bump we're seeing for the cycle of election looks pretty aggressive. Then, you know, a, a month or two later, something else came along that kind of that stole, yeah. stole a lot of the thunder for the rest yeah. of the for foreseeable future. But, yeah, early on, that was the big talk. Man, this looks kind of juicy. Then instantly it became too cheap. But that was, yeah. again, again a, yeah. a driven by other forces. And I feel you out there on the – that was looking insane in the initial move for, for Trump. And then things uh, quieted down. And then in his first year in office – Val got taken out to the woodshed and shot. <laughs> it spent most of the year in the single digits, which is the one thing no one had on the docket for Trump. So, yeah, interesting stuff. But we are looking at it now for the first time in the zero DTE era, which will make things uh, interesting at the very least. So stay tuned to us, listeners. We'll probably do some fun live content around the election. Everyone's asking us for it. So I think it's time to revisit that. And since everyone's looking at all things zero day these days, I think it's time to revisit those as well. A little bit of the old Options 101. It's time to learn how to manage risk and generate additional income for your clients. It's time for Options 101. everybody let's do it let's get out the little options 101 today we're going to talk about an aspect of the zero day phenomenon that is obviously integral to them which is time uh, you don't have a lot of it when you're talking about zero day options if you're coming in you're trading true zero day so they are listed and they die that day you don't have a lot of time the clock is ticking quite literally the second you initiate a trade in these so let's talk about that reduction in time and how that impacts the options and how they perform there's some obvious impacts to that right out of the gate, which is, of course, you have a very limited amount of time for your strategy, your synopsis, your hypothesis for the market, whatever it is, for it to play out. It is bell to bell, and that's pretty much it. That's the nice thing about these products. They go away at the end of the day. It's also the challenging thing for these products. They go away at the end of the day. So you have to be right by that closing bell. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. If you can be right the next day, it won't really help you <laughs> out there. The less obvious thing that people don't talk about as much, though, is kind of the impact we see on some of the fundamental options 
mechanics, the variables, the Greeks out there at the end of the day. So let's get into some of those out there right now. Uh, the big dog for a lot of you out there in the option space, whether you're on the advisor side, on the active retail side, somewhere in the middle. A lot of you still key around Delta. That's both good and that's bad. Delta is an interesting beast when it comes to all things zero day. Uh, let's start with a quick refresher on how time impacts Delta, right? You know, you're at the money option is going to be a 50 Delta. That's pretty much going to stay around the 50 level, no matter how far you, I mean, if you, if you increase time infinitely, it will decrease a little bit, but effectively at the money is always going to be flickering right around a 50 Delta. Now, of course you're out of the money options, that Delta, which is also kind of a shorthand for their probability of expiring in the money. It's not technically mathematically correct, but it's a good shorthand for at the end of the day. Obviously, if you increase time, probability is going to increase. So out of the money option, that delta is going to increase a little bit. In the money option, opposite, delta is going to decrease as you increase the amount of time out there. But we're not talking about increasing time. Are we? We're talking about going the other way. We're chopping all that time off. You get one day and that's it. So that makes delta an intriguing beast for all things zero day. It really is kind of just a, a static snapshot, an indicator, if you will, of where, where your directional emphasis, how much exposure, how much bang for your buck you have at that given second. Because remember, at the end of the day, these are effectively binary instruments. At the end of the day, that delta is going to be zero or it's going to be 100. There's no way around it. So where you stop along the way, intraday, 43, 72, 35... Doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> you're going to zero or you're going to 100. And that's the path you're on from the jump with these options, listeners. Now, obviously, if you're focusing mostly on out-of-the-money liquidity in the zero day, that delta is going to be steadily approaching zero throughout the day unless you get a nice move in the underlying, which you certainly can. And then it goes in the money, in which case, in the money options, as the clock is ticking, steadily approaching that 100 or that one delta at the end of the day. So when you're trading zero day option, just bear that in mind. You're on that path. You're on that roller coaster. You're going to zero or you're going to 100. So where you hang out in the middle doesn't really matter that much. It's informative. It's useful. But it's not where you're going to end up and probably where you're not going to be even in a few minutes. Matt, let's start there, sir. What are your thoughts on this massive reduction in time that we see with these zero day options and how it impacts even uh, straightforward things like Delta, sir? Well, you've done a great job here, Mark, on uh, putting this together. It is one of the trickiest things, especially right when you get towards the, the time of expiration. I remember uh, you know, being a market maker and, and then also teaching uh, what to do uh, if you had a big position on right around uh, the time of expiration. And you know, we'd often have to go in and fill out cards and, and ex and uh, exercise things and not exercise. A lot of people, retailers don't even have that uh, sense of doing that, which will, which will bring up um, another confounding factor that I'll get into a little bit later. But what you have right now is, is, is well said. You know, you always, you always think if you're at the monies, okay, that's like a 50-50 coin flip. And then you're out of the monies, you have to say, okay, what's the, you know, in your mind, you're saying, what's the probability of this thing going through that strike and that's how you kind of that's how i would look at my my deltas you know a probability the gamma is really hard to think about because you know gamma is such a crazy thing you know the second order it's hard enough you know just thinking about how your deltas are going to change and obviously that's what gamma means but uh thinking about gamma itself you know it could you don't want to be misled you can maybe glance at it, but I mean, you know, you, you have to think about uh, what is going to be exercised and what's not going to be exercised. And, and you're exactly right. And if you think about it, you know, out of the money also, I'll just throw in one, one other thing here. If volatility goes up, the out of the money has more of a chance. So you're in effect, your delta goes up on those. If the volatility goes up, same if the volatility is falling, if there's not much going on, even though time's going, volatility's taking that delta out as well. So it, 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 time and volatility act the same way, um, especially as you're getting close to uh, the time of expiration. Um, so yeah, those are those are the things that I think about, Mark. True, time and volatility. At the end of the day, uh, two 
two sides of the same coin when it comes to the impact on your options out there. Uh, your good point about Gamma. You know, it's funny, Matt. When I first walked on the floor of the SIBO, I, I worked with one of the first market-making firms that really utilized uh, handhelds, you know, these remote wireless handhelds that you could use to manage positions. And you could actually, as opposed to before that, you really had to go send a clerk and they had to go do a run for you and they would come out to you and they would show you your risk of your position across all the all your Greeks and everything else. And there was a snapshot in time and that was it. You couldn't really have a dynamic look at your Greeks. This is one of the first firms that really had that. And so we had a lot of cool analytics. That's kind of commonplace now, but was very cutting edge for the time. And I remember even then when he started using these these machines and started using them to calculate our Greeks and looking at our overall positions, we'd walk in on expiration Friday, which was once a month back then. It's every day now. But, you know, you walked in on expiration Friday and, you know, the developers and everyone else and the risk managers would tell you, don't even pay attention to the numbers it's telling you for gamma and theta. And you look at your machine and you'd see why it would be showing you a number in the billions, you know, it just infinite numbers and that that is the challenge with gamma and its flip side theta they both kind of move in lockstep listeners and when you get to that final moment of an option's life gamma and theta become these just infinite numbers that really are hard to wrap your heads around out there so as matt kind of alluded to it's kind of hard to say oh my gamma is a six on a zero dt or anything like that because it's very much a moving target it's going to change as time progresses. It's going to change as your vol moves around a little bit intraday. Uh, so again, gamma, we joke about these being gamma bombs because what it means at the end of the day is your delta is going to change quite a bit. And that's what gamma is at the end of the day. It's the rate of change of your delta. And we already explained that your delta is going to zero or it's going to 100. There is going to be change in your delta when you're trading zero. That is the one thing you can... Know with certainty with zero day, there will be change in your delta, which is why your gamma is going to be very high. But what that number is locking into some kind of number, something you can sink your teeth into, I wouldn't fixate too much on that. Same thing with theta. At the end of the day, you can look at theta like this for zero day options. If you're buying premium and it's an out of the money option, all of that is theta. <laughs> all of that is going to be gone at the end of the day. So that is your theta. If you paid 45 cents for an option, guess what? Your theta for that option is 45 cents. And if it's out of the money option, unless something changes, all of that is going to decay away and do so fairly rapidly. So it's an easy ballpark figure to just look at what your net premium is. Now it gets a little bit wonky if you're looking at options that have a little bit of an intrinsic component. If your option is 20 cents in the money and you paid 45 cents, now you have... 20 cents of intrinsic value, 25 cents of extrinsic. It gets a little bit wonkier there. But at the end of the day, all your extrinsic value, that is your decay. That's going to go away, all other things being held equal. Now the market could whip around. You could go in the money. That could change. But that's a good rule of thumb when you're looking at zero-day options. I just paid 45 cents for this option. It's out of the money. That's all decay unless something else happens that I hope comes to pass out there. Uh, Matt, what are your thoughts on... Kind of just using the options overall premium as your shorthand for theta for the day, sir. Yeah, I mean, the value is the value, and, the, and you know pretty much uh, how that's going to play out. Um, the confound, I'd like to introduce a confounding factor, Mark. I mean, you traded SPX. Confounding factors. That sounds fun. Yeah. That might be a good name um, for the show. There's also confounding SPY. Factor. <laughs> and what happens is in uh, American style, you have to wait until 4.30, so an hour, like, uh, well, what is it, 5.30? So an hour and a half sometimes after the market closes before you are sure that you've picked up that and what the, the, the uh, amount of stock that you're going to have if, if you're going to get exercised on or not. SPX and, and all the cash-settled Europeans will close right at, 4 p.m. on the expiration day, but uh, you know, so we were we were doing back tests, and we were saying, why is spy coming out so much better on these like short sh short term strangles than the SPX? And it's because there's a lot more premium left in the SPY options right at you know four o'clock Eastern time. The close of the market on the expiration day. 
But if, if those options can be exercised, then that actually can and will create more premium in those options. And theoretically, if, the, if there's a movement after the market, which there has been a lot recently, those could be exercised or you could exercise them. So they're, they're actually effectively have a longer lifespan. So I just wanted to throw that out there, Mark, as a confounding factor for these American and, and why I think, you know, the uh, European, the cash settled indexes are uh, gaining in popularity. I, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I always appreciate a good confounding factor. Uh, Mr. Matt out there. And you're right, you know, the exercise or lack thereof of these products is a key to them. It's one of the reasons so many institutions love SPX. It's European. There's no early exercise risk out there. Whereas SPY, it's American. You do have the early exercise. And if you're not familiar with those terms, go back into our archives or check out, of course, uh, programs like Options Bootcamp. We get into detail about all that kind of fun. One last Greek to touch on when it comes to zero day. Uh, Vega is an interesting beast out there as well. We were just talking about the impact of volatility and how it correlates to time in this scenario. You add more vol, it's like adding more time. You take a vol out, it's like taking away time. You can look at it from that perspective. The thing with a lot of these zero day from a pure Vega perspective is there isn't really a ton of Vega. At the end of the day, Vega and time are highly correlated. You go out in time, you're trading leaps, you're trading six months, you're trading long-term options. There's a lot of Vega to be found in those options. Options going away in a day or less, not a ton of time really to have a big volatility impact. So Vega is not really your key Greek out there at the end of the day when you're looking at zero day. At the end of the day, remember the things you talked about earlier, the impact of time, impact on delta, and the fact that your delta is going to zero or 100. That is really the key for these zero day options. And so you what side of that train, what side of the roller coaster are you going up the hill or are you going down the hill is really what you need to be focused on with these options. And, and that it all kind of stems from there. Matt, anything else you want to add on this overall reduction in time and its impact on the Greeks for options, sir? No, I think that's a, a pretty good way to think about it. Uh, uh, you know, these uh, these markets um, they move <laughs> uh, right around uh, expiration, so you you have to be watching it a lot a lot of these times. And and um, you know, Greeks are helpful, uh, but know the amount that you have on, how much time's left, and percentages is is, is the the type of thing I like to think about, Mark. And we like to think about earnings season. So let's get to it now, listeners, with the earnings volatility report. Earnings announcements can move markets, but what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events? Let's find out with the Earnings Volatility Report. All right, listeners, we are recording this kind of the tail end. We're really in the dregs now of earnings season, unless you're really excited by Nike and McCormick, in which case I apologize. Those are your big keys to your portfolio. Maybe you work at Nike, you have a ton of Nike stock. So in which case, that could be an important one for you. But for most people out there, the names that they watch every day, trade every day, have mostly reported at this point. And to say it was a banger season, I think, is putting it mildly out there, listeners. Pretty much every week so far this year, listeners, has been over our barometer of 100%. The lowest we got was week five at 102%. Everything else was far north of that, listeners, and it gives us a average now for this cycle of a whopping 124%. In fact, we did poll you folks. I'm trying to find the exact number here. We did it about a, I want to say, here we go. Uh, we actually, you know, it was a few months ago. It was the beginning of season. It was in July 8th. Uh, we asked you quite simply the long term average for our earnings season volatility is 113%. That's where it's hanging out right now. That already is a long term record for us since we've been crunching these numbers. Do you think we're on track for another explosive cycle? Will this cycle beat the record? So, will it come in north of 113%? And nearly 77% of you chose yes, 23% chose no. That was clearly 
the right way to go because uh, this cycle was a banger, 124%. I have a feeling our long-term average will be ticking up yet again, listeners, as we head into and start getting ready for the next cycle. Matt, we have most of the numbers in the docket now for this previous season. What are your thoughts, your takeaways on yet another explosive earnings season, sir? Yeah, I mean, I think that we we guessed it when we saw that it, it seems like it's inverse, uh, meaning the uh, the movement and the profitability on long straddles during earnings, which is, of course, what we measure, is inverse to how volatile it is in the macro environment. So when we saw COVID, when we saw these big down moves, uh, the returns on those weeks weren't very good for option holders of earnings stocks. And, and we saw a little bit uh, in this earnings cycle that we had a little bit of a downturn um, and it affected the returns that, you know, I think week three and four only had, we're still above water, but still above a hundred percent, but not as much as, as the rest of the month. And, you know, we thought it was going to be a lot because if, if we're going to have low volatility and there aren't that many macro events affecting the market, then people really focus on earnings. And I really think that there's a lot more volatility in earnings now than there has been previously just with the economy who's fitting in well, who's not fitting in well. And I think that's reflected, Mark, in the uh, returns that that people are seeing on their long straddles, which, of course, we measure in the earnings of volatility report. And we're about to embark on yet another roller coaster of an earnings season, sir. Any thoughts, any predictions you want to get out now, sir? Oh, wow. Uh, I can't believe it's almost <laughs> another one. Um I don't know. I think the ball is pretty high. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, election and related stuff going in. I'm going to say it's going to be coming back more to the average. Uh, so I'm not going to say a banger like I, I guessed last time. Oh, interesting. So more somewhere around the 113% level. Interesting. Interesting. Might have to do another poll with our audience and see what you folks feel. Speaking of what you folks are all excited about, it is time to get the buzz. Busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, everybody. Welcome to the buzz, the portion of the show where we break down uh, the hot stories that are driving the narrative out there in the world of options. Right now, it's still all about uh, one thing when it comes to the options market, which is can this this volume train, this explosion, can it continue for you, the advisor out there? Is it safe to get into these options waters? Is there a lot of flow, a lot of a lot of water to dive into? You know, last month there was a surprise. You know, over one billion contracts in August, one point oh six seven billion contracts. August supposed to be sleepy. Listen, it's supposed to be the quiet seasonal period for the options market. August. The dog days of summer and, of course, mid to late December. Two times when not much is supposed to be happening in the world of options and, indeed, the markets. And yet, they didn't get the memo last August. And now, of course, we are recording this on October 1st, so we want to look back. The month is now over. September is over, listeners. But, unfortunately, our pals over there at OCC, they take a little while to crunch the data (laughs) for the numbers for September. But you know what? We don't want to wait that long, listeners. So we did a little bit of sleuthing ourselves behind the scenes, digging into some of their volume queries. And by our math, first off, September of 2023 was 847 million contracts. That was actually down quite a bit from September of 2022, which was 915 million. So last year, kind of a bit of an outlier. And of course, August of this year, one point, almost 1.07 billion contracts. So Where does September fall? Was it another kind of outlier to the downside? Was it a banger? Well, by our back of the napkin math, Mr. Matt, and we'll have to wait for official confirmation from our friends over there at OCC. We had about 386.7 million total ETF options going up last month, 83.6 million index options, and 492.3 million equity options, which all adds up to 962.7 
million contracts, which actually is a nice lift from September of last year, up about 115 million contracts from a year ago. Now, again, it's all frame of reference. If you're comparing it to August to last month, it's down slightly. But again, last month was an aberration. We had August 5th. I don't think anyone really expected August to come out of the gate that hot. But 962 closing in on a billion contracts for September, that is nothing to sneeze at, even beating the hot 915 million level we had back in September of 22. That also puts our average daily volume for the month of September at about 48 0.3 0.3 million contracts, which is nothing to sneeze at and lifts our overall 2024 year to date average daily volume to about 47.7 million contracts. So nothing to sneeze at. Again, not final numbers, Mr. Matt, but 962.7 million contracts. What do you think, sir? How does that sit with you? Yeah, I mean, it really has a lot to do with what the market did. I mean, back in 2022, uh, in September, the market just went straight down. Um, you know, it, it opened somewhere around 388 and went down to 360. So it was it was down quite a bit uh, in 2022. 2023, you know, if you're comparing it to there, then the market was just kind of sitting there uh, most of the most of the month, and there you know there wasn't much going on. Volatility was was pretty tame. Um, nothing much happened. And then, um, yeah, I mean, in this September, you know, like you say, especially after, you know, it came down a bit in the, in, at the beginning, but uh, that's kind of surprising. It's pretty healthy uh, to get that good of a September with not too much going on in it. Uh, you know, you, you did have the election, it did have a little bit of a correction, but nothing, nothing that major. So I think that's a pretty healthy month, Mark. Yeah, we did have the Fed spooking some folks with a half point, so that's going to add a little bit. But you're right, we didn't have the August 5th level sell-off and meltdown out there and subsequent aggressive rally. So, uh, yeah, interesting stuff out there. We'll wait for the official numbers to come in probably the second we turn off the mics for the show today, listeners. They'll have those numbers. But we can't wait that long, listeners. 962.7 seems like a pretty hot month to me. And you know it's always hot. It's your questions. Let's get to some of those right now. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on the optionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at the optionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider. Or stocktwits.com slash options insider. All right, everybody. Welcome to your segment. Of course, it's all your show, but this is where you take the reins. I've been saying for a while we should do a all questions considered episode because we have so many questions out there. We keep having so many other interesting things to talk about, which pulls us away from that. But we'll see how many of you we could squeeze in in the time we have remaining listeners. Let's Excuse me, let's go out to Dan A. first. He just wants to know a seemingly deceptively simple question. He says, is there any real way to trade long straddles profitably consistently over time? Thanks. You know, Matt, this is something we've talked about, um, not so much on this show, but I've talked about it with Dan a lot on our options boot camp program and others. Uh, the notion people always write in, they, they, they want to keep tilting at this windmill We keep trying to walk them back from it uh, for the simple reason that I know you and I, when we were market makers, we had to deal with a lot of long, what were effectively long straddle positions at the end of the day. But we were able to defend them using a gamma scalping. Of course, we had institutional accounts. We had favorable margin, large amounts of capital, a very different beast. If you could sell stock and buy stock against your long straddle, then yeah, it makes it a much more profitable and consistently long-term profitable type position because you're able to defend it while you're waiting for that that big move to materialize. Uh, but for retail, that's just challenging. It's not cost-effective to sling a bunch of stock. They don't have the same margin treatment. So I've always been of the, of the camp that, you know, outside of those crazy moments in the market, right? You know, the meme stock rampage of 2021, the meltdown of March 2020, you know, these markets where everything's just extremely hot and ball is exploding, that's when you can probably put any straddle in your back pocket and probably do pretty well. But uh, over time is the part of his question where I kind of come up short. So I, I end up telling retail for the most part and for the advisors who are managing those accounts, 
probably not the best strategy to go down for the reasons I just laid out. But what are your thoughts on, as Dan A wants to know, is there any real way to trade long straddles profitably consistently over time, sir? Yeah, so you could go to orats.com and our back tests. We have 181 million back tests now. Um, how many do we have? A million back tests for long straddles. So there are some profitable straddles in SPY, for example. But a lot of those straddles are timing. Um, they want you know a moderate level of volatility, not low, not high. They want a moderate level of RSI, so kind of in the middle is what most of these uh, profitable strategies are doing. Shorter term, 15 days, as a matter of fact, with a tight stop loss and with a profit target around 100, 150 around there. Those are the, those are the, the good ones. Uh, they're only in the market about half the time, a little less than half the time. So other than that, uh, leaning long, <laughs> So, uh, like I'm talking 60 delta uh, calls, 40 delta puts. That way, if it just grinds up, uh, you're getting long. You're already long, and, and if it goes down, it tends to go down faster. So you you have the volatility uh, improvement. So you probably want to have some long deltas, um, and and yeah, I mean have some uh, stop losses, uh, profit targets. Uh, watch the levels that you're trading. Um, go look at the back test for for some other exit uh, triggers and entry triggers. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what I would suggest, Mark. <laughs> Leaning long, I like that. That's kind of cheating, though, right? Then you're just you're really just making all your profit off those twenty deltas extra or whatever. But it, it's one way to go about it. I'll give you that. You can cheat and go the uh, just get some long deltas in your back pocket for a rainy day, listeners. At the end of the day, you probably, if you are, if you insist on doing this, you're much better off doing something risk mitigated. You know, making that iron, that long straddle into, let's say, an iron butterfly, for example, where you're selling wings against it. So now, at least you've sold something. So for most of those days where your straddle is just sitting there, decaying in your face, you at least have sold something against it to offset some of that erosion. So that's probably your best road. If you're smart, you don't go down that road to begin with. Uh, let's go out to uh, Brandon. He says hello. Long-time listener here, first-time questioner. Well, welcome, Brandon. We love all you folks out there who are taking the plunge for the first time. So I was looking at leap options and noticed that the out-of-the-money delta was greater than 0.5. He says, example, Intel, 25, 25 strike call for April 17th of next year. He says in the delta, I have to go look in my chains and see if he is correct, but that's the example he gives us. What is causing this? I am familiar with the Greeks, and it was always my understanding that Delta shows how in the money the contract is. Thanks for the fantastic show. Well, you're welcome, Brandon. Uh, Matt, this is actually a very timely question just came in because we were just talking about this <laughs> a few minutes ago, about the impact of time on Delta. Now, in this case, he's going the other way. He's going away from zero DTE. He's going all the way out to April of next year. Uh, Mr. Matt, why is he seeing a Delta over 0.5 going out to April next year? Well, what you have to think about is is not the price of the stock now, but what the price of the stock that's uh, the future price of the stock. So the more time that you have, then there's more implied uh, drift up by the interest rate. Um, so that's that's the reason you're seeing these what seemingly looks out of the money. Um, they're like right now in, in our chain, we have a 50 Delta at the 25 and the, and Intel's at 22.68 It's down 3% today. So, uh, that's the reason you see that market is, is the higher the interest rates, uh, that'll make it look even, uh, even weirder because again, the drift in the black Scholes formula has to do with the risk-free rate. And so that, that's, what's causing that mark. Ah, the old Delta drift. Strikes again. That's a great question, Brandon. I'm glad to see you're, you're clearly paying attention. And I love when they send in specific examples because uh, we love it out there. Keep listening. Keep sending in those questions. We love to hear from all of you, all of you guys and gals out there. Uh, let's see how much do we time. We got time for a couple more here. We got questions all over the place. Let's go. Let's just keep going here. Let's go to Stratos 85. Actually, one of our uh, one of our. One of our pro members, he says, uh, what are your preferred ways 
to take advantage of high skew stocks like meme stocks. So by high skew listeners, he obviously means and meme stocks in particular, of course, that means the, the call wing is going to be inflated from an implied volatility perspective versus the put wing or just versus what you would traditionally expect in that name in normal circumstances. So all of the money calls suddenly much more juicy than you would typically expect. So all of the strategies to take advantage of that are going to be good. Buying the stock, selling the far out of the money call. You're going to get a lot more for it than you than you would normally. And if it's a meme stock, it's going to run. You can do verticals. Again, the same thing. Buy the at the money call. Sell a far out of the money call. You can do that vertical for a much more attractive level than you ever could before. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can play around with that. But anything that allows you to get some sort of exposure to selling that far out of the money part of the wing is always going to look pretty good. Mr. Matt, you you love playing around with different strategies for meme stocks. Uh, Stratos85 wants to know, what is your preferred way to take advantage of high skew stocks like meme stocks, sir? Yeah, you really got to look at the verticals, way out of the money verticals. So you kind of look at the uh, the option prices, and then what will happen is the option prices will start to tend to move together. <laughs> so it's like, a five dollar up, uh, a three dollar, a two dollar, another two dollar, and you go, okay, well that that's definitely the place where I want to buy the two dollar and sell the other two dollar. So it's not going to be like that, but you want to find the place on the skew that's the best for you uh, to be long. Usually, um, you you because you're going to want to be selling skew, so you're going to be one is selling the the call skew, I should say. You're going to want to sell the higher strike and buy the lower strike. So you're going to be long, but you want to pay as little premium as you can. What will happen is, is, you know, you might say, well, it's never going to get there. It doesn't have to get there. It just needs to go towards that. And then that will expand. And then that's how you make your money on it. And then you have to have a pretty good exit strategy. So that's the way I like to do those. Also, sometimes calendars, Mark, you could get a, a good, um, a skew going there in, in, in the term structure where you're, uh, selling a front month and buying a lower vol back month. Um, so, and, and then, you know, this is really risky, but legging in sometimes when the stock's moving around quite a bit, or it's a wide stock, you just put in bids and offers. And if you get filled, then you do the other side. So that, that's a lot more risky, but sometimes that you could get, you know, some, some pretty good fills, especially if, if you see volume going up on a particular, on a particular strike, either long or short. Um, that's how I like to trade those, Mark. Ooh, legging. Matt getting risky, getting wild out there, Mr. Matt. I like it. All right, we're coming up against us. I'll give you your choice, dealer's choice, Mr. Matt. For our last one, do you want to do Spy, Bitto, or the Russell 2000? Oh, let's do, oh, uh, what else is it? Let's do Bitto. I mean, since I made my first trade in Bitto <laughs> on on the uh, on the show here many years ago, yes. uh, let's do Bitto now, Mark. We lured you to the dark side. All right, to Bitto we go. This question comes from Dominic. He says, "How does the group easy for me to say? How does the group view Bitto as an options trading candidate? It pays a very large dividend, which is certainly worthy of note. Do they like selling puts or even owning the underlying to attempt?" to capture that massive dividend. Ah, yes, Bitto and its mighty dividend. It is uh, just went ex-div yesterday. We were talking about it on the crypto rundown. I said, wait a minute, where did all this massive amount of volume come from right at the end of the day, like a quarter of a million contracts just exploding onto the tape? Then I went and looked. I said, oh, it's going ex-div. That's why. So, yeah, there's a lot of people doing or trying to do exactly what you're talking about here, Dominic, which is capture that, uh, that extreme dividend out there. Now, the dividend in Bitto has made it both intriguing and confounding for a lot of people out there to trade. It's a huge payout. It's, you know, I haven't looked at the latest numbers from this year, but in the past it has been well north of 20, 25, 30%, maybe more, 40%. Sometimes when Bitcoin's on a run, you have that nice setup in the futures. It could be a substantial payout, well over a dollar in just the dividend in a month when the underlying is trading, you know, 16, 17, 18. So it could be substantial out there. So people are going to try to capture it. For whatever reason, Dominic, if maybe that's too challenging for you because all the issues we laid out in the past, the dividends are going to weigh on the calls. If you're trying to sell calls, you're not going to get as much juice for them. It causes this dislocation around the dividend every time. Uh, if you're, That's something that maybe you don't like. And also, 
just talking to the folks from, I believe it was Rex Shares on our crypto rundown last week, uh, they've listed some new products on the iBit option. Uh, they've been comparing the total return, even with the dividend. And again, I haven't crunched these numbers myself to verify it, but they're usually pretty good with their data. And they were saying it lags in total return by somewhere around 5%. Uh, so compared to just you know owning the underlying out there. So if that's something that intrigues you, we did just see the approval about a week and a half ago now for options on iBit. Now, iBit will hold the quote-unquote physical. They will actually hold spot Bitcoin. So it's kind of analogous to GLD versus some of these other ETFs like Bitto that attempt to approximate the underlying using futures. And they have all the issues they have to deal with, roll yield and everything else, and that causes these wild distributions that we're seeing here. iBit, they haven't listed yet, but the ostensibly will not have that problem. They hold the actual spot Bitcoin. So it's analogous to GLD versus some of these other Franken products out there that don't have that same, that don't hold the physical. So that might be a way around that for you too, Dominic, if this is something that's kind of uh, confounding you a little bit. Maybe you say, keep your powder dry until iBit is listed. Now that's the question. We don't know. They're approved, but it doesn't mean we're going to have them tomorrow. OCC has to figure out the mechanics of, of clearing them. The exchanges have to work out. There's some other regulatory things that still have to be figured out. So Hopefully, we'll see those before the end of the year. I don't know if I'm too optimistic about that, but that's just something else to consider. I went for a while there, Mr. Matt. I apologize. By all means, what do you have to say? I know you love Bitto. You've traded it live on the show, sir. What do you have to say for Dominic as an options trading candidate? I used to like Bitto a lot more. So the way I play Bitto is I have crypto other places, and or I have Bitcoin. And so I just say, well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to do the opposite in uh, my account. And so that's how I can hedge it. Right. So, I mean, Bitto was down pretty big today. Uh, what was it down 8.4%. Yeah. So that's good for my options, bad for my, my, my Bitcoin. And but dividend coming right now, baby. This has been confounding to me actually, because the dividend, uh, cause I'm trying, it, it, you know, I, I don't want long stock cause I have long, essentially long bit, Bitcoin. So, um, but so I, I just trade non X div uh, months is what I usually do. Uh, I know I'm not answering his question uh, well because I don't I, I don't usually play Bitto for for the dividend. It is a big dividend, and actually, it somewhat seems like uh, uh, some of the the markets are are pretty good. I've been getting some pretty good fills. So, you know, if you wanted to collect that dividend, um, you know, it does seem like a a pretty decent way to do it. But, you know, mostly when you you have dividend stocks, they're not nearly this volatile. So Bitto's all over the place, um, and so I, you know, it's hard to it's hard to do a, a dividend play, you know, on a stock that's moving around, you know, at a mid 60 vol, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I generally don't like to, to do dividend plays on, on the, that high of volatility, uh, unless of course you're long and sell a call and, and keep the stock and you get the dividend, but it, it works well until it doesn't. And today it didn't because the stock's down 8.4%. So hopefully that helps Don make, uh, I, I personally wouldn't do it for the dividend, even though it's, you know, like, like it says, it has been, you know, pretty decent, um, very decent, uh, but you know, it's so volatile, it, it makes it a little bit, makes it a little bit tough, Mark. Uh, worth noting, Dominic, as well, they did just add Monday expirations to Bitto now, so that you could have, I traded some of those yesterday, actually, for the first time, so I sold some Monday expiring calls against some underlying I had just to get rid of it, so uh, to avoid this exact scenario, it's gonna, going to go get wiped out today with the dividend, we knew that was coming, uh, so they do offer more expirations up, so you can trade around uh, the x div a little more which is inter interesting but as matt's point is valid it is a very volatile name to try to be capturing the dividends and so be prepared for these you know three percent intraday moves <laughs> that's just the name of the game out there and unfortunately that music means we are out of time for this episode of the advisors option i think all of you out there take the time to write in listen rate and review we love you all out there make sure you're listening uh, to the full network including the futures rundown which will be hitting you tomorrow after this as we record this and of course anytime on demand whenever you feel so inclined out there and mr matt if they feel inclined to maybe run some back tests or chat with a rogue ai named otto where should they go what should they do 
Yeah, ORATS.com. Big news is is October 1st is we are live. ORATS is a live platform, live APIs. Uh, it's crazy times over at, at ORATS. You know, the best data, fastest data now. And uh, you could trade through brokers. Interactive Brokers is up. You could go connect your Interactive Brokers account. It's uh, it's mayhem over at ORATS, Mark. So everyone come on over and check it out. And we have a good community going. Uh, people are chatting, so it, it's it's been great. ORATS is live. You flip the switch. It is live. You need to put out that gif of it's alive uh, for, from Frankenstein out there. That would be a good one out there. So congratulations. I know that was no small amount of effort and expense on your part, Mr. Matt. But to that, you know, at the end of the day, live data makes a difference. And so uh, if you want to check that out for yourselves, listeners, see what Matt and the team have been working diligently on behind the scenes. Only one place to go, orats.com, O-R-A-T-S.com. The place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. And, of course, give him a follow on the old Twitters while you're at it as well, at option rats, all one word. That is going to do it for us out there in on the network, I should say, for today. Back again tomorrow, like I said, Futures Rundown and Options Boot Camp. Thursday, of course, we've got all the fun with This Week in Futures Options of the Option Block, Friday Vol Views, and then for you pro folks, come back for a little bit of Options Oddities. Then we'll be back again next week, all the way into next month in another episode of the Advisor's Option. Stay safe out there, everybody. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end -end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>